In the aftermath of the Persian invasion, the formation of the Delian League brought together numerous Greek states, presumably to guard against retaliatory attacks by the Persians. In reality, the League was a de facto Athenian empire. Meanwhile, the Peloponnesian League, led by Sparta, sought to check the growing power and ambition of Athens. Endemic warfare engulfed the Greek world as the two warring factions gradually dragged nearly every Aegean city-state into the conflict. Sparta and her allies were able to raise formidable armies, and by 425 BC they enjoyed overall field superiority. The Athenians could not fend off forays into Attica and were forced to pursue a policy of retreating behind their city walls. But they used their maritime supremacy to great effect, and just in the last two years they decisively defeated the Spartan fleet at Pylos, capturing most of their ships and a 420-strong garrison on the island of Sphacteria. Including 120 Spartans, the elite full citizens of Sparta. Equally important, the Athenians captured the island of Kythera, which served Sparta as a trading post to Egypt. Not only did this cut off a key trading route, but the Athenians could now use the captured ports of Pylos and Kythera to repair their ships and launch raids along the coast. This video is brought to you by our friends over at CuriosityStream. As their longtime subscriber, I recommend their history documentaries, where you can find topics from ancient, medieval, and more modern times. But if you're interested in other topics, CuriosityStream is a streaming service that features thousands of some of the best, highest quality educational documentaries out there. One you should check out is Alexander the Great. Trying to conquer the world was unthinkable, yet he nearly succeeded. He was the first European to establish an empire that stretched from the Mediterranean to the end of the known world, and you can watch it for free. As our viewer, you get free membership for the first 30 days. Visit curiositystream.com slash historymarsh to get unlimited access to the world's top documentaries and non-fiction series, and use the code HISTORYMARSH when you sign up to get 30 days completely free. And by signing up on CuriosityStream, you'd also be supporting our channel. Trying to press the advantage after their victories at Pylos, Sphacteria, and Kythera, two Athenian commanders, Hippocrates and Demosthenes, targeted the Isthmus of Corinth aiming to sever the Peloponnesian communications in half. However, under the leadership of Brasidas of Sparta, the attack on the strategically important city of Megara was repulsed, but the trading post of Nicaea fell to the Athenians. With these setbacks, the situation looked bleak for Sparta, forcing them to sue for peace. But Brasidas proved to be a thorn in the side of the Athenians. He secretly moved his forces through Thessaly and, with the help of the Macedonians, he opened a second front, inciting rebellions and defections among Athenian allies in the northern Aegean, most notably the colony of Amphipolis, the centre of Athenian power in Thrace, where most of the timber for their ships came from. In the south, Sparta's ally, the Boeotian League, rallied under Theban leadership. Pagondas of Thebes, a fiery and persuasive nobleman, used his rhetoric to reorganize the Boeotian forces and launch an attack on Plataea. Losing Amphipolis was a serious blow for the Athenians, who now found themselves fighting a two-front war of attrition that they could not win. Making matters worse, their manpower was impacted by the plague that struck Athens repeatedly between 430 and 426, killing up to a quarter of the population, including Pericles himself. <sighs> to have any chance against the Peloponnesian armies, Hippocrates and Demosthenes realized they needed to deal a quick knockout blow to Sparta's Peloponnesian alliance. 
They considered striking at the heart of the enemy by invading the Peloponnese directly, but this meant fighting the vaunted Spartan army in their own homeland. Instead, Hippocrates suggested they attack the Boeotian League. Knocking them out of the war would secure the northern flank, and any future Spartan operations into Attica could not rely on the vital logistical support that Boeotia provided. Furthermore, Spartan forces commanded by Brasidas in Thrace would be cut off, and to return home, they would have to march through hostile territory. The two commanders devised a plan for a three-pronged attack. Demosthenes was to lead a naval expedition, first to Norpactus, where he would gather troops and then launch an attack on Siphae on the western Boeotian coast. Meanwhile, in the east, Hippocrates was to command an attack on Delium, a strategically important border city that could serve as a base of operations into Boeotia, and its access to the sea could be used by the Athenian navy to attack along the Boeotian coast. The third component of their plan was their contact with a network of Boeotian dissidents. Numerous pro-Athenian groups in the villages and cities, most notably Chaeronea, pledged to incite unrest in their hometowns and spread the rebellion across Boeotia. The plan was bold. But, if successful, the Athenian attack on the two coastal centers would split the Boeotian response and the rebels would cause disruption from within. They would overwhelm and topple the oligarchic regime and install the pro-Athenian leadership that would join the Delian League against Sparta, thereby tipping the balance of the war in favor of Athens. Then, on the agreed date in late autumn, Hippocrates marched on Delium, synchronizing his attack over land in the east with Demosthenes' amphibious assault in the west. Three days into the march, Delium and its prestigious Temple of Apollo came into view. The city got its name after the sacred island of Delos, believed to be the birthplace of the god Apollo. It was thought that the nearby temple, a sanctuary of Apollo, granted divine advantages to those who controlled it. Hippocrates ordered the temple grounds seized and began setting up defenses. His soldiers dug trenches and used stones, brick, lumber and wooden stakes to fortify the perimeter and build wooden towers along the ramparts. But he had no way of knowing that the carefully planned plot with the Boeotian conspirators had been compromised. Without arousing any suspicion, the Boeotian League discreetly cracked down on the traitors, regained control of Chaeronea and reinforced Siphae, and the Athenians were none the wiser. When Demosthenes' fleet approached, the city was well defended, and he had no choice but to turn back. With the conspiracy to topple the regime thwarted and the western Athenian attack repulsed, Pagondas could now advance on Delium. Back at Delium, the ramparts were completed after five days of construction, and Hippocrates allowed nearly all of the levied and allied light infantry to return to Attica. Having not seen any sign of the Boeotians, the Athenian commander was convinced that they were busy fighting the rebels and Demosthenes, and felt that no enemy relief force would come to aid the city any time soon. In his mind, garrisoning the fortification with his hoplite infantry and a contingent of cavalry was sufficient, and it made no sense to keep the levied troops in the field. But as his troops marched out, the approaching Boeotian army was spotted. Hippocrates rushed out of the makeshift fortifications to rejoin his troops, realizing that they were outnumbered and caught in the open. Pagondas wanted to seize the moment to launch an attack before the Athenians could combine their forces, but he faced opposition from his generals. 
Knowing that the rebellion to the west was crushed and that Demosthenes was repulsed, some in the Boeotian leadership thought it pointless to fight the Athenians and preferred to let them leave. Frustrated, Pagondas insisted the column must keep moving, arguing that letting the Athenians go would be a mistake, for they would come back. Despite tensions running high in the Boeotian camp, the Theban commander personally ordered the men to advance. However, the opportunity to fight and defeat the Athenians piecemeal was lost. Nevertheless, Pagondas tried to regain the initiative by marshalling his troops to the high ground on a hill overlooking the plain. Both armies had similar numbers of hoplites, light infantry and cavalry. Pagondas drew up the Thebans up to a depth of 25 men and had a clear advantage on the right. Hippocrates deployed his hoplites eight rank deep, which gave him a stronger center and a slightly longer battle line. Pagondas tasked the cavalry and javelin men on the wings to hold the defensible position in the broken terrain on the slope to help prevent a possible envelopment. It was late in the day, which meant that the battle had to start soon. Hippocrates began addressing his men. Then, unexpectedly, the Boeotians advanced downhill. Despite being slightly outnumbered, the Athenians charged, confident after their impressive victories over the Spartans a year earlier. The sloped terrain was not the most conventional battleground for the Greek hoplites, and as the two armies slammed against each other, the downhill momentum quickly added to the pushing power of the deeper Theban formation. However, the rest of their battle line was a mix of Boeotian allies, lacking depth and quality of their Athenian counterparts. Boeotian infantry stood little chance, suffering badly against Hippocrates' hoplites. The shouting of orders was drowned amidst the clamoring of steel and the harrowing screams of the fallen. Seeing that his center and left were in trouble, Pagondas quickly sent his cavalry reserve to their aid, using the hill to mask the movement of his troops. On the wings, the difficult terrain and the Boeotian javelinmen forced the Athenian cavalry not to engage. Meanwhile, the prowess of Pagondas' finest Theban warriors bore fruit. Pushing downhill with their shields, they forced the Athenian hoplites to gradually give ground. But in the center, the Boeotian formation was crumbling. Overrun by Athenian heavy infantry, some of the men turned their backs, clawing their way back up the hill. The Thespians on the left, however, refused to yield and were gradually surrounded. So ferocious was the fighting amidst the dust and confusion that some of the Athenian hoplites attacked each other, mistaking their own men for the enemy. Fighting to the death, the heroic last stand of the Thespians prevented the collapse of the Boeotian left wing. Seeing the enemy breaking through, chasing their comrades up the hill, Pagondas' cavalry and javelin men on the left started moving back to avoid being cut off in case of a rout. Victory for the Athenians was near. Surely, any moment now, the remnants of the Boeotian center would break. But then, Pagondas' reserve cavalry appeared on the crest of the hill. Despite lacking the numbers to stabilize the line, they remained undeterred. Incredibly, the Athenians panicked. Seeing the enemy cavalry steamrolling down the slope, they thought that a second Boeotian army arrived on the battlefield. Troops in the center that advanced furthest up the hill lost their nerve, routing en masse. Just minutes later, the rest joined them in flight. Some 500 Boeotian troops fell at Delium. Athenians lost 1,200 men, which is among the highest casualty rates for hoplite battles. Their commander Hippocrates also perished, reportedly not long after the battle started. The pursuit lasted until sunset, and only nightfall prevented further losses for the Athenians. 
Most of them retreated to their makeshift fortification in Delium, where they were besieged for 17 days, before finally agreeing to surrender and return home. The Athenian aura of invincibility after their victories at Pylos, Sphacteria, and Kythera was broken. Their attempt to knock Boeotia out of the war and force Sparta to seek peace had failed. Delium was a decisive victory for the Boeotians and the Peloponnesian League. It reinvigorated the Theban pride and encouraged Sparta to keep fighting. The Greek world would be plunged further into intermittent conflict before the Peloponnesian army, led by the Spartan commander Lysander, would finally force the Athenians to surrender and seek peace, some twenty years later, in 404 BC. Credit goes to our awesome patrons who make videos like this one possible. Consider joining them to support our work. You can also support us by subscribing to our channel and clicking the bell button to get notified when our new videos are released. And as always, thank you for watching.